Thank you, Frank. Thanks to all of you who decided to stick around for this. <clears throat> My talk is about 50 minutes long. Today's talk is about what law and planning can do to house the homeless. We begin by framing the problem and then to identify the diverse populations that make up a homeless society in America. We discuss some of the entrenched reasons for homelessness. We discuss homelessness in our history, spend some time discussing the plight of the homeless and why current models do not work. And at last, I will discuss some solutions including funding. The assumption is that we all share the common goal to get the homeless off the streets, off freeway underpasses, off parks, bikeways, buses, subways, and into lawful situations. Neither law nor planning alone can solve the curse of homelessness, but law and planning can ease the rules, develop new ones, and provide places where the homeless are allowed to exist. After all, community design has planned for nearly every other human eventuality, commerce, industry, traditional housing, daycare, schools, sidewalks, and parking areas for people in wheelchairs, dog parks for people who have dogs, day and night parking for, for bikes and cars, and jails for criminals. Cities with thousands, thousands of homeless people are surely capable of acknowledging their vast unhoused citizenry and planning for their undeniable existence. The current situation makes no one happy because businesses don't like panhandling, camping, and filth on their doorsteps. Consumers don't like to confront panhandlers or step over people in doorways to shop. Employees do not like commuting to work on buses and subways, sticky with human waste, including seats wet with urine so they cannot sit. Neighborhoods don't like the garbage strewn by homeless encampments on their flanks. And homeless encampments make public parks and greenways unsafe, or at least they feel that way. Hospitals and medical personnel cringe at releasing homeless patients with tuberculosis or other infectious disease for the fifth or tenth time, knowing their pattern of not taking their medication as required means an ER will see them again and the potential for drug resistance and problems for all of us increases each time. The homeless who are not all panhandlers, filthy and dangerous, do not learn like their desperate, unsafe, inhuman situation either. Yet cities throughout the country follow essentially the same template. They criminalize and penalize the homeless. They conduct grand sweeps in which police tow the cars and RV homes of otherwise homeless people, in which police march through encampments, throwing away people's tents, coats, and other meager possessions. Officials shine lights in homeless people's eyes when they sleep, demanding they go elsewhere, knowing full well that there is no elsewhere for them to go. It's time to create safe, comfortable, and legal places for the homeless to be. Because in the absence of providing places for the homeless to lawfully be, cities across the country will continue to see tent encampments sprouting like colorful weeds, blooming along freeways, bike and walking corridors, commercial districts, industrial areas. They will continue to see armies of RVs and cars occupied by people and families desperate for a door to lock along side streets and in parking lots. But like Sisyphus's rock, while bureaucrats unleash an army of tow trucks to dutifully haul away someone's everything in an RV or car to an impoundment lot for destruction, other cars and RVs emerge in their place. And similarly, not long after the dust settles from a sweep, another encampment moves in. Homeless people are human beings. They are not homeless vapor. The current long-term options of building new, affordable, or low-income housing are important, but they have not and cannot house the homeless 
during the year or more that they languish on a wait list for housing they may or may not qualify when it opens up. In fact, despite significant efforts, homelessness in the United States is increasing, and there are two realities that make it unlikely we will see a reprieve. First, there are fewer and fewer jobs. Following decades of a transformative job market, which first left behind people living on the margins, and then family wage jobs fled to cheap third world labor markets, and now robots are replacing at a dizzying pace other human workers. Many jobs that are left are low wage, temporary, lack benefits, and otherwise fail to make it possible for people to have a home, daycare, and work. People without jobs or with inadequately paying jobs find it difficult to pay rent or mortgages, putting them at significant risk of homelessness. They experience poverty. In these situations, disillusionment and poverty are the successors to hope and prosperity. Statistical invisibility sets in because the workless force is no longer even counted among the unemployed. We only notice it when we, it appears at us from behind a cardboard sign seeking money, or as the panhandling annoyance at a store or library, or by the growing size of a homeless community on the edge of a freeway or a walkway, a park or a river. The profound changes in the job market have and will continue to displace workers, create poverty, and with that displacement and poverty will contribute to homelessness in America. Second, baby boomers are retiring in record numbers. Yet a recent study shows that 39%, 39% of workers have saved nothing for retirement. And of those who have saved, 47% say that the value of their savings and investments is less than $25,000 and 24% say their savings are less than $1,000. Most retirees report relying on Social Security for a majority of their retirement income. But a retirement that relies on $1,405 as your average monthly Social Security benefit faces the inescapable reality that the aggregate cost of medical insurance, uncovered medical expenses, and housing, even affordable housing, is at or beyond your ability to pay. So not surprisingly, somewhere between half to a third of our homeless population is over 50 years old. It appears evident that this trend will continue. Housing the homeless requires the willingness of the housed to craft a solution. The prevailing American work ethic makes it hard for housed people to spend dollars on the homeless. We think to ourselves, the homeless are lazy, no good, entitled frauds, drug addicts, or criminals. They should simply clean it up, pull themselves up by their bootstraps, and work like the rest of us. And even if we take this view, we want and need for the homeless to be somewhere. And that means we have to provide places they can be. Because throwing them in jail, which is often the only option available, is really expensive and it sounds no solves nothing. Now homeless populations differ, which means there can't just be one housing type. The vast majority of the homeless are physically or mentally disabled, the elderly, young people, LGBT children, children who have aged out of foster care with no clue of what stable housing means, victims of domestic violence with no place to go, parents who cannot afford daycare work and a home, and people who have simply fallen on hard times. Consider the plight of Janine as reported in Social Work Today. Janine is 48, a mother of three, and lives on the streets. Her homelessness began the night she and her children fled her husband when he broke both of her arms, her leg, and her jaw. The social worker at the hospital found her temporary housing in a shelter for survivors of domestic abuse. When she was once again able to walk and use one of her arms, she sought new employment as she was too afraid to go back to her former job because her husband might find her. However, she was only able to find low-wage temporary jobs. And when her time in the shelter ran out, she was unable to find afford safe, stable housing for herself and her children. And plagued with chronic pain from her many injuries, 
and unable to meet the co-pays for her prescriptions, she turned to street opioids to get through the day. The Public Child Welfare Agency, citing her substance use, erratic employment, and homelessness placed her children into three different foster homes, three different ones, and told Janine to participate in substance abuse treatment, parenting skills, training groups, and psychotherapy for her PTSD. Try as she might, she missed visits with her kids and other appointments because her permanently injured leg made it impossible for her to stand for long periods of time, take buses, or walk distances. Ultimately, her parental rights were terminated. One winter night, her feet bloody and sore, and her leg in chronic spasm from walking all day. She took shelter in an abandoned building. There she was raped. Another night, an infected spider bite landed her back in the emergency department, where the foot on her good leg was amputated. Janine's plight isn't really so unusual. It's true that some claim homelessness is an alternative to an American culture they reject. For example, a man in the latter category describes his life living in Slab City, California, which is a large plot of desert owned by the state in which people otherwise homeless squat. It looks a lot like Burning Man, but with far fewer people, somewhere between 150 in the summer and 2,000 in the winter. It has been an encampment for decades. The man explains, there are no, there's no California culture here at all. By that I mean strip malls and apartment buildings, doom buggies and off-road racing and crowded freeways, filthy beaches, and arrogant politicians. I like to call Slab City a high-tech hobo camp. This population ekes out a living on their own terms and would not call themselves homeless. They live in campers and RVs and shanties that they call home, but the life they eke out trespasses on public and sometimes private property, and this small and unsympathetic element of the homeless population should not justify ignoring the vast majority who, like Janine, are homeless not by choice, but are in desperate need of a place to go. The agony of homelessness is hard to understand until it befalls someone we know, or worse, someone we love. But it is inescapable that a homeless person could be any one of us. If we succumb to mental illness, addiction, or other calamity, in fact, many of us regular housed folk are only a few paychecks away from homelessness ourselves. There are other entrenched reasons for homelessness in America, and the problem is intractable precisely because it involves a complex interdependence of co-conspirators. We've talked about family wage job losses and relying on Social Security. Others, one, the shuttering of mental institutions in favor of a system of wholly inadequate and underfunded community care, which started in earnest in the 1970s and persists to this day at the hands of both Democratic and Republican administrations. Second, the growth of land use policies that restrict land supply and add expensive bureaucratic layers to housing proposals, adding significantly to the house, cost of housing. And three, the opioid crisis and the rise of other disabling addictions. There are no doubt others. We talk about the three main contributors I noted next. Shuttering mental institutions, freeing the insane. A disproportionate number of homeless people, some studies say one third of men and two thirds of homeless women, are mentally ill, many severely so. One commentator, Dr. E. Fuller Torrey, observes that approximately 175,000 homeless people are seriously ill, and the number is probably bigger. Dr. Tory writes that among the hardcore homeless, the incidence of severe mental illness is much higher, and one study, for example, found that every single one, every single one of the hardcore homeless was mentally ill. The hardcore hom homeless population, they use garbage cans as their primary food source. Many of these homeless are acutely dangerous to themselves and to the rest of us. But our ability to respond to the plight of the seriously mentally ill homeless is hamstrung by laws that require leaving the mentally ill alone unless they're essentially actively harming themselves or someone else, and the reality that police have nowhere to put them other than a medical hospital, which has incentives to release them as soon as possible. Dr. Corey quips that to commit a mentally ill person, he has to either be killing himself in front of the admitting doctor or trying to kill the admitting doctor. So there's a disconnect between this standard for committing the mentally ill 
and the fact that the homeless and mentally ill are often volatile and can spin into violent psychoses without provocation that any of us can see, the provocation is known only to them and the voices in their head. Thus, the rate of violent crime among homeless mentally ill is much higher than mentally ill patients, people in stable housing. The rate of violent crime is 40 times higher, and the rate of nonviolent crime is 27 times higher. Dr. Tory writes, an especially sobering example of a crime committed disproportionately by homeless mentally ill people is pushing strangers onto the tracks of a subway. A study in New York City reported that 40%, 41% of such perpetrators were homeless and 59% were psychotic at the time they committed the crime. <laughs> Homelessness among the mentally ill has exploded since the 1970s when courts at the request of civil libertarians with good intentions made involuntary commitment subject to standards mental institutions could not meet. As a result, institutions for the mentally ill were effectively shuttered with no real alternative. While the problem is often laid at his door, President Ronald Reagan is by no means solely responsible for the plight of the mentally ill or homelessness today. Rather, policies of his era were driven by the mental patients' rights movement, largely championed by the ACLU and New York chapter lawyer Bruce Ennis, who was credited with starting the mental health bar. Ennis successfully brought cases with the personal goal to, quote, either abolish involuntary commitment or set up so many procedural roadblocks and hurdles that it will be difficult, if not impossible, for the state to commit people against their will. Of course, by definition, the mentally ill are unable to voluntarily do anything. There is no involuntary and voluntary with the mentally ill. They don't recognize they have a mental illness in the first place, let alone when it's necessary for them to check themselves into a mental institution because of it. The fallacious premise underlying the ACLU court victories presumes severely mentally ill people have the reasoning capabilities of healthy people, and they can make voluntary choices to seek medical intervention during psychotic episodes. My father taught me the danger of such syllogistic reasoning with the example he would put on a race board at dinner time, all fish can swim. Wendy can swim, therefore Wendy is a fish which translates here to all people are entitled to make their own choices. The mentally ill are people, and therefore the mentally ill are entitled to make their own choices. But this fallacious syllogism helps no one. Dr. Tory writes, when we protect the rights of the severely mentally ill so stringently that they cannot be treated, we infringe on the rights of other members of society, sometimes with tragic outcomes. Another commentator writes, the right to treatment is more fundamental than unrestricted liberty. If we do not provide adequate treatment, we offer the patient no freedom at all. The laws that followed the judicial decisions of the 1970s that forbade involuntary commitment of the mentally ill, except if they were found to be a danger to themselves or others, have endured to this day. The danger to oneself or others standards has been interpreted so strictly to result in the commitment of almost none of the insane. Instead, being institutionalized, instead of being institutionalized, the severely mentally ill have been re released to live on the streets where they can be seen today incapable of caring for themselves and often representing a danger to themselves or the rest of us, but not enough to justify confinement. One author explains, the mentally ill and society at large paid dearly for these victories with civil liberty lawyers pressuring them constantly, judges and psychiatrists have generally required someone to come within a whisker of killing himself or his neighbor before invoking the danger to himself or other standard. In the interval, the untreated mad have endured and inflicted a multitude of suffering. For instance, a schizophrenic in Wisconsin, mute and refusing food, ate excrement instead. But he was seen only eating it once, his public defender protested. Could the doctor on the witness stand swear that one time would inevitably harm someone? No? Case for dis commitment dismissed. In Washington, D.C., police brought an attractive young woman panhandler incoherent and hallucinating to the hospital, where the examining psychiatrist judged her no danger to herself and released her. She was raped and murdered in an alley a few days later. Homeless, mentally ill people in crisis have no way to cope. 
They can't distinguish between a lawyer walking to Starbucks from an alien operative. The homeless mentally ill person on the street may have family who wants to help, but who are prevented from doing so due to very real concerns about personal safety. Dr. Tory reinforces that the relatives of severely mentally ill have reason for a concern, explaining severely mentally ill individuals who become violent do not select their victims at random. Multiple studies have confirmed that between 50 and 60 percent are family members. Mothers are particularly at risk. While these are st sobering statistics for families of the homeless severely mentally ill, it is also sobering for the rest of us. These statistics mean that 40 to 50 percent of the victims of violent crimes at the hands of the severely mentally ill homeless are strangers. Concerns for our own safety means it's essential we recommit to appropriate situations the homeless mentally ill. The role land use planning has played. One of the reasons some people become homeless is because they can't find affordable living quarters. This is because this is a problem of poverty driven by job changes and losses that we have already discussed. But it is also a problem made much worse by restrictive land use programs. The cost of housing is driven by many factors, but a leading one is a constrained land supply and the restrictive regulations that are the hallmarks of a comprehensive land use program. A 2016 study by the National Association for Home Builders shows that on average, governmental regulations account for 24.3% of the final price of a new single family home. Professor Stephen Eagle, who's with us here today, cites two leading land use economists who've concluded that America's housing problem is worse in communities with significant land use restrictions. Those economists explain, in the places where housing is quite expensive, building restrictions appear to have created these high prices. Today, jurisdictions committed to land use planning have the least affordable housing in the country and find themselves among the communities with the worst homeless problem because land use regulations A, limit supplies of buildable land and B, make housing more expensive. You can see this from the chart that seven of the 10 least affordable markets have the nation's largest population of homeless people and all seven of those unaffordable communities have very strong land use planning systems. Early on in the history of land use planning, the dissenting justice of the California Supreme Court in Agins versus City of Tiburon predicted, quote, perhaps of greater concern is the consequence that Tiburon and many other governmental agencies enacting similar land use plans will price properties within their control out of reach of most people. Only the most wealth wealthy will be able to afford purchase and construction of lands in such areas. The environment which Tiburon seeks to preserve will disproportionately benefit that wealthy landowner whose home will be surrounded by open space, unobstructed view, and unpolluted atmosphere. Some communities answer by imposing affordable, stick-built housing requirements on private developers. The problem with this approach is the private developers pass the cots of those affordable housing programs onto the buyers and renters of traditional housing, increasing their cost and making traditional housing less accessible for the next layer of worker who is not yet homeless, creating a vicious cycle of unaffordability. My proposal, which we will explore in a moment, includes relaxing land use requirements and land supply restrictions so that housing costs related to compliance with land use programs are minimized. The role of the opioid crisis and other addictions. The National Conference of Mayors reports that most of the cities surveyed say that 68% of their homeless cite substance abuse as the main cause. Another survey in New Haven, Connecticut, was a survey of homeless people who reported that 25% of them said substance abuse was the cause of their homelessness. One writer, who was formerly homeless herself, disputes that substance abuse is the main driver of homelessness. But she agrees that addiction happens to people once they become homeless and then makes it hard to get out. She says the misery of homelessness itself drives many people into addictive behaviors. Just ask yourself, how many sexual assaults, how many beatings, how many humiliations, how many nights sleeping cold and in pain with no hope of escape would it take before you drank to get yourself through the night? 
Whether chicken or egg, it seems beyond dispute that substance abuse and addiction play a significant role in homelessness, whether as a cause or as an impediment to reentry society. It seems we've forgotten our history. We used to provide places for the homeless to go with shocking honesty about the reasons for conscripting a person into service there. The poor farm or almshouse was a public facility paid for by counties, often with federal money, where the homeless and poor were required to go and work to be reformed into productive workers. These places were largely operated as farms, the food from which produced income for the facility and fed residents and staff. Many were places no one would want to live, while others became relatively comfortable communities. Involuntary incarceration of people on poor farms was based on the unilateral decision of governmental officials, often called overseers, or the petitions of citizens to the overseers. For example, the petition of 10 citizens to the overseers of the poor of the town of Haverville, Massachusetts, asked that a Mr. Kelly be removed from his home or otherwise dealt with or put on a farm for the poor because he was a poor man with a large family from bad habits and incapacity, and that he does not and cannot make proper provision for his family who are in consequence in a very destitute and miserable condition, and that his idle habits and his family are a great encumbrance to the neighborhood. Along the similar lines was the confinement of a poor, to a poor farm of Ms. Adeline Knott. Her warrant was drawn up by two overseers and read that she was a resident of Portland, Maine, and is a person able of body to work, has not a state or otherwise to maintain herself, and neglects and refuses to do so, lives in desolate, vagrant life, and exercises no ordinary calling or lawful business sufficient to an honest livelihood, and in our opinion is liable to become chargeable to the city. Her lawyer argued that her involuntary commitment was unconstitutional and that, quote, no citizen should be committed to a dungeon or workhouse without trial or hearing by persons with no judicial power. The Maine Supreme Judicial Court, unimpressed by these arguments, upheld the warrant. The court said, the indigent have no claim to be supported in their idleness. Their poverty generally grows out of an unwillingness to labor or is occasioned by reckless and improvident habits and the overseers acted within their authority for Ms. Monat's benefit to remove her from temptation to commit crime and to teach her industrious habits so she could be restored as a useful member of society as soon as possible. Regardless of how they got there, many poor farm inmates, as they were called, stayed for decades, including individuals and whole families, and did not leave even when they could. Despite their steep drawbacks, many poor houses developed a sense of community and were considered home by the residents. Today's homeless shelters are a lot less humane, less comfortable, and less effective than a poor farm. Today's homeless shelters foreclose any sense of community and are divorced from the culture of street life. Homeless shelter patients or patrons must be out in the morning by 6 or 7 a.m. to go nowhere. Shelters have entry hours that are not conducive to having a family or a job or a life. Consider a waitress or a dishwasher who works evening hours, with most shelters locked down by 8 p.m. Really, where do you go? Shelters are often overcrowded. They can, rules can be harsh, unrealistic, and not evenly enforced, based whether a particular occupant is liked or not. Homeless advocate Kailisa Shea writes, homeless shelters in the areas around them are often hunting grounds for human predators. Some of the craftier ones get jobs at the charities for the shelters while most others just watch for individuals departing in the morning or arriving in the evening. It's not just rapists either. Predators in search of excitement will track a lone person leaving a homeless shelter so they can beat him or harass him for fun. Clearly homeless shelters can be unsafe, particularly for women. They are often filled with lice and bed bugs, and the close quarters create acute disease concerns with TB being particularly fearsome. The homeless report having their things stolen, in particular shoes, are the targets of theft, a problem when the shelter kicks you out to the elements in the morning. Some shelters are run by faith organizations where the circumstances of homelessness provide an opportunity for unwanted proselytizing. Shelters have barriers to entry, rules like drug-free zone and so forth that disqualify many homeless people. And many shelters refuse pets. And homeless people with pet companions, and it's a lot of them, won't leave their pets behind. 
And so while the homeless shelter in New York City evolved from the good intentions of the Coalition for Homeless that successfully sued the city of New York to establish a right to shelter, that quickly made to, came to mean a cot in a homeless shelter, which became known for crime, overcrowding, disease, and gang warfare. Many shelters across the country continue to hold such reputations. Even with these problems, the demand for shelters outpaces supply for the desperately homeless. For a shelter that opens its doors at 7 p.m., the homeless need to begin lining up at 4.30, a homeless shelter version of the opening day of Star Wars. Homeless shelters are not the answer. Predictably, the homeless are using shelters less and less, and street homelessness is increasing. According to the 2017 federal point in time count, which estimated that 554 homeless people are in the United States. Experts agree the count is an, an underestimate and that it's more like around 2 million people are homeless annually. Whatever the number in America, in 2017 the overall amount of homelessness increased. There was a 3% decline in the number of homeless people willing to stay in the shelter. We're going backwards in our goal of getting the homeless off the street. So solving homelessness requires an understanding and recognition of what human beings need for social stability. Psychologist Abraham Maslow, we all remember him, taught us that people must have their basic needs met before they can be motivated to do things like enter drug rehab or job training or seek happiness or otherwise seek their potential. It seems obvious that some part of the homeless population will only join the ranks of the sober or employed or otherwise join society when their basic needs for survival are met. It is this model of human needs that drives the current policy to house the unhoused. The so-called housing first model first introduced in 1990 provides housing to the homeless without preconditions such as the applicant proving sobriety or mental stability. And even though the program has been around 26 years, it's not solved the problem of homelessness. Rather, a study explains that since 2001, one-eighth of America's low-income housing has been permanently lost, and the United States needs seven, more, seven million more affordable apartments for low-income families. Neither the government nor the private sector is keeping pace with the need. Any model that relies solely on stick-built housing will fail to meet the goal of providing immediate housing to homeless people. And building bigger or taller apartments for the homeless is no answer either. Big box human poverty warehouses, reminiscent of the failed projects of the 50s and 60s, should not be reproduced in any context, including this one. A good reason to avoid big box housing is that these behemoths result in unhealthy social networks. Housing for our half a million to two million homeless people should be established for the number of occupants that can be accountable to one another and cohesive. Our neocortex limits the number of social interactions we can effectively maintain. We should be paying a little bit of attention to biology. British anthropologist Robin Dunbar matched up the size of animal brains to the size of effective social groups and discovered that the maximum number of people in an effective social network is 150 and that intimate associations are composed of five people and that the next effective grouping is 15 and then to about 50. It turns out that hunter-gatherer societies, Roman legions, effective military groups, and effective businesses have about 150 people. According to Professor Dunbar, people who need to work together successfully require smaller numbers. If you want to have an organizational unit that involves very, very closely working together, you cannot do it with a group of even 150. You may have to have 15 because that's the limit at that level of intimacy that people can work together. Housing the unhoused will be effective if we provide places for the homeless to go at the moment we discover their homelessness, the, un the unhoused are willing and able to go to the places provided. The places are socially effective. The places can be and are supported with social and medical services, and the homeless are required to go there. 
So before we get to my solutions, let's just talk a little bit about what it's like on those mean streets. We've gone backwards in the care of the homeless from the days before the Civil Rights Act, before women's suffrage, before words like inclusive communities and livability were coined. Thousands of homeless people in our communities live in circumstances way worse than a dog pound, worse than a zoo animal, and far worse than a poor farm. So imagine for a moment the plight of a homeless person. No place to be out of the rain or the snow or the scorching heat. No place to sleep or store possessions, including medicine, especially medicine that has to be refrigerated. No place to store your food, your clothing, your photographs, your legal papers. No place to cook food, no place to shower, no restroom. No garbage facilities, no official to take seriously your assault, rape, or other victimization. If the parked car or RV you happen to live in looks like the residence of a homeless person and just one person complains to the government, today's equivalent of the overseer, your car or RV can be towed away. On the fiction, it is abandoned. Its contents, including animal companions, effectively stolen by government officials without any recourse. In Portland, Oregon, and likely most other cities, there are no RV or mobile home parks that will take old, old RVs for short or long stays. The best option for a poor person with an old RV looking for a space rent in Portland is a single RV park that allows only 1991 vintage and newer but when I called over several months, several months, there was no availability in that park. Poor people can't afford most 1991 and newer RVs anyway. What poor people do instead is they search Craigslist for cheap or free RVs, working or not. Opportunistic owners of old or derelict RVs are happy to sell them or give them away, as opposed to paying some junker to haul them away as trash. There is an entire black market industry populated with mostly other homeless people with cars who periodically ch tow the cheap campers or non-functioning RVs when their otherwise homeless occupants are green tagged by city authorities and desperate to move their world to avoid the city's tow police. The homeless can't get into a mobile home park either because the cost of mobile homes has gone through the roof. And even if a homeless person can manage to afford a mobile home in a park, this population can't pass the beauty contest of eviction history, credit check, income requirements, or criminal background check. They can't get into apartments because of these problems. Even subsidized ones will often reject a homeless applicant. And some have dogs, large dogs of varying breeds, which are prohibited in any of the otherwise available options, including much of the stock of subsidized housing. And despite what you may have heard, if a homeless person figures out how to call a 211 hotline or to search the web for resources, they're unlikely to find any help. Moreover, any help will require many, many, many phone calls to many dead ends and many voicemails that no one will ever return. And eventually, the cell phone battery goes dead. Of course, you have no place to plug in your dead cell, so the search ends. If a homeless person miraculously connects with someone, they will almost certainly be told there won't be any housing help for them, and what help there will be will be two or more weeks away, often requiring an appointment. The homeless lack the social skills required for effective communication with the usually bored and disinterested person on the other end of the line. So tents and RVs are illegally everywhere they aren't supposed to be, subject to official toes and sweeps. I have personally witnessed a deeply mentally ill homeless woman cry as the city of Portland, Oregon, towed everything she had away. The RV, the mattress her grandma bought her, the blankets, the pillows, the dog food, the clothes, the headlamp, the ice ch chest with milk for cereal, the pumpkin pie she splurged on as a sad treat for the holiday. And the tow people came armed with cruel city police, 
you better be nowhere near that thing when we tow. And the then broken homeless shell of a person stood in the rain crying because she didn't have her coat on that cold day, because it too had been towed away. She didn't have the faculties to get what she needed for basic survival out of the RV when the authorities came knocking. And this is what is happening. I have one more story before moving on. Here, consider the story of a homeless 66-year-old college graduate and former journalist who, after a rear-end car accident, developed debilitating fibromyalgia. All of her family members are deceased. Then the recession arrived, she writes. I had been working primarily as a freelance writer, editor, and PR manager, but well-paying gigs rapidly slowed down. I was running out of money fast and needed steady work. Day after day was spent sending out hundreds of resumes and applications, but I rarely heard back and only landed one or two interviews. Eventually, I couldn't scrape together enough money from savings and the occasional gig. I needed money badly, and when I turned 62, I applied for early retirement to activate my social security checks. At $672 a month, it wasn't enough then, and it wasn't enough now. Two years later, I'm living out of my car in search of a home. Rent is much too high to be covered by my monthly social security checks, and living out of a motel is a luxury I just can't afford. Even campsites or trailer parks where I could pitch my tent and make a temporary home for myself can cost up to 1000 a month. And it feels like timing's running out. My dog and I need a home as soon as possible. The first time the police found me, I had fallen asleep in a school parking lot. I knew it wasn't the ideal place to park my car for the night, but I had gotten lost driving around town, and I couldn't find a better spot before exhaustion sent in. I fell asleep and woke up with a flashlight in my eyes and a police officer demanding I leave. I burst into tears. There are many, many more stories like this. What is clear is that these tragedies are unfolding in cities all over the United States, and the problem, it is getting worse. So what are the policy and regulatory solutions? First, no one should be turned away from housing because they're an addict, they're in recovery, they're not in recovery, have a dog, a criminal history, a history of eviction, bad credit, or just a history of being a problem. Getting the homeless into housing should be simple and fast. Land use codes should change to allow places for all the homeless people to exist. I propose placing rough, roughly like groups together. Veterans might be housed together. Families with children together. The mentally ill together. Addicts not in recovery or those that are in, in different units together. Young adults together and so forth. Regulatory scaffolding must allow housing to be established inexpensively and with lot, without a lot of bureaucratic red tape. Land use codes must be changed to allow RV living long-term camping in tents, and tiny house living as an alternative to traditional stick-built housing. These facilities must be allowed to have porta-potties and portable hand-washing facilities. It should be okay to have a communal area with a kitchen, showering facilities, garbage receptacles, places to charge cell phones, and they should be developed for 15 to 35 residents remembering our biology. Instead of towing RVs to an impound lot, government should tow them to a suitable place where those RVs may park and stay. Instead of temp encampment sweeps where people's belongings are thrown in the trash, government officials can transfer the contents and occupants to suitable tent communities. Homeless people who do not have their own camping equipment or RV can be housed inexpensively in publicly acquired models, used models, and types. If the RV does not have sanitation or cooking facilities, who cares? There is no reason that RV cannot be towed by the government to a supplied place that has such facilities instead of to an impoundment lot for destruction. It's crazy. If an RV is filled with garbage, there's no reason not to provide a harmless person with a garbage receptacle and insist that they use it. I have heard government officials complain that the RVs the homeless live in are not fit for human habitation. This is the kind of Chardonnay sipping baloney that the homeless expect from the housed. They are not asking us 
to live there, especially for homeless women, as between a door that locks and being on the streets, the homeless really don't much care if the housed would not choose to live in their RV or tent. And if the RV is so bad, then the officials should be required to provide the homeless person with another used and inexpensive RV and allow the homeless person to transfer their belongings to such alternate. A used older RV is an awful lot cheaper than a stick-built apartment and a lot more effective than nothing. The location for these non-traditional housing types could be dispersed and should not be concentrated. It is unnecessary that they be in the central city or even close to services. Different types of urban, suburban, and rural locations might be best. Proximity to transit makes sense for some, but it's not essential for all. And with the dawn of autonomous vehicles, the location op options are really limitless. My point is that there is no magic profile of the perfect location for housing types to house the homeless. We just have to do it. Land use rules should be changed to allow housing operated like youth hostels we enjoyed in our youthful or maybe not so youthful travels. I propose land use adjustments that allow defunct shopping centers and motels to be repurposed, repurposed to homeless housing, medical and social service offices. Conversion to these purposes should never be required, but it should be an option for owners, including banks, that really have no other clear use for these facilities. Land use rules should be ad adjusted to allow combinations of these housing types on a single property. Kitschy old motels can be converted to nice and inexpensive single room occupancy living, SRO living, sometimes with the bonus of a pool and hot tub. A good example is a tiny house RV motel community in Las Vegas. How is downtown Vegas reversing its seedy reputation? With the help of a tiny village of airstreams that's home to young creatives and entrepreneurs. <laughs> it's just this awesome community of about 30 people that live together, all in different tiny forms. So this tiny house, an airstream, or a micro apartment. There's Tim Dogs, an alpaca, and a chicken, and it's kind of crazy, but I'm super fortunate to be able to call them my family. <laughs> While this community is very upscale, obviously, and expensive, the Airstream RVs utilized are the top of the line, and that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about used uh, RVs. But the relaxed regulatory model is not. It's kind of cool. It's kind of kitschy. Even rich people could choose to live this way if they had the option. And providing the option to live in an RV or tent is certainly not conscripting homeless people to something worse than what they now have, and it's a lot better than conscripting them to a street. A legal place to exist where a person need not always worry about officials lurking to rob, move, or arrest them would be sublime. Just ask a homeless person, and this is what they will tell you. Moreover, the model I propose would include targeted services to the particular community, ensuring their basic needs are met and that they can begin a journey to recover whatever that may mean for them. State laws must be changed such that the severely mentally ill homeless who refuse treatment and medication may be brought involuntarily to facilities where they can be stabilized and required to take medication for their illnesses. This is critical. If and when such people are released from such facilities, they should be released into supportive housing programs designed to maintain their stability. And for a civilized society to work, two critical laws are necessary. One, no one can be allowed to be homeless. Two, the homeless must have a place to live where they are required to go. With lawful places for the homeless to be, vagrancy and trespass laws can be enforced. So if the land use system supplies places, how might the government respond to those land use code changes? Each place to house the homeless should be geared to a similarly situated population to be served, to maximize the efficient and effective delivery of services, and also to facilitate a growth of a sense of community and accountability. Housing types should be matched to existing service providers to ensure adequate social services are provided to meet basic needs, food, shelter, safety, security, so the occupants can adjust life challenges in their next layer of the Maslow hierarchy. Priority for stick-built traditional housing, apartments or otherwise, should be given to families with minor children. These 
facilities should have intensive family services available, including parental training and support, job training, high quality preschools, high quality daycare, including before and after school. They should be locationally situated so the minor children enroll in the best public schools. And supports should be in place to ensure that the children have suitable educational services to ensure they receive appropriate support from those public schools. Such facilities could partner with local experts in child psychology so the children who need it, which is most of them, can participate in on-site or close-by relationship, anger management, and other social skills courses. Nonprofits like Dress for Success could assist and provide job training for parents. Parents in need of recovery would have those services provided to them. Provide priority for high quality nutritious meal services would be baked into this housing type. Single room occupancy housing should be prioritized for disabled people, including mentally ill and physically disabled people. SROs for the mentally ill should have intensive services and medication management. The youth hostel model should be prioritized to serve homeless youth and non-disabled elderly with <coughs> intensive services to meet the needs of the particular youth or elder group involved. Particular to the youth group, programming to teach homeless youth how to get along in society and basic life skills should be provided because these are things they have missed when they've been out on the street and probably as a consequence of their history before arriving there. Elder group hostels would include things to do, like connections to volunteer opportunities, perhaps create connections between youth and elderly facilities, inexpensive but interesting elder hostel type adventures, and in-house recreation. The stick-built housing facilities, traditional and SROs, should be composed of no more than 150 residents to provide the maximum effective group for an effective and connected social sphere. They should not be concentrated in one area, but dispersed throughout the community. The severely mentally ill probably need SROs on a smaller model of 15 to 35 to work. The youth hostel model should be composed of no more than 15 to 35 residents, because one of the clear goals is socialization of the residents at both ends of the age spectrum. Food trucks should come by periodically to all of the homeless types to ensure the homeless are properly fed. Again, the goal is to ensure that the basic needs of this population are met so they can move on to treatment and join society as much as they are capable of. Failing to do this is making the rest of us crazy. Imagine for a moment a hot August night in Portland, Oregon in 2016. A 46-year-old constructed worker and married dad is fed up with a homeless person's RV hanging out in his neighborhood for many, many, many days. So he did something completely out of character and base. He threw a four to five inch PVC packed pipe with explosive powder under the so-called dilapidated RV that was then occupied by three otherwise homeless people and a dog in the man's neighborhood. The bomb malfunctioned and no one was hurt. The man somehow managed to get off with probation and a misdemeanor charge, even though planting a bomb is a felony. Because everybody got, this, he was going crazy with the situation. But he, Kidwell, felt so bad, he tried to help the homeless woman, Hoxtra, and her companions. The Oregonian newspaper reported, Kidwell has taken steps to make amends with Hoxtra. His attorney said, her client bought Hoxtra a used RV in much better condition than her old one. He had it cleaned, replaced a battery, and paid for the title to be transferred to Hoxtra's name. Hoxtra is now living in the RV, but hasn't been able to get it registered because she doesn't have insurance. Hoxtra moves the RV around from time to time, but doesn't park it near Kidwell's house anymore. The newspaper reported that the construction worker husband dad found a shelter for the homeless woman to live in but she refused to go because she couldn't bring her dog. Presumably, she simply moved her RV to some other neighborhood that did not want her. My proposal ensures that there's an RV community that allows the dog, where this woman's RV and her dog can go to live as much and as long as they want. So funding, how do we fund it? Well, first of all, we have to figure out what financial resources we have because stunningly, we have no idea what we spend on homelessness now. None. Zip nada. 
We have no idea the aggregate spending of nonprofits, state, local, and federal governments on house homelessness. It's way past time we figured that out. We do know that homelessness is expensive. HUD proposes to spend $2.4 billion in its 2019 budget to quote unquote end homelessness. But that doesn't include the budget of the US Veterans Affairs for homeless programs or the budget of the National Institutes of Health or US Interagency Council on Homelessness or the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and so forth. It does not include non-federal state, local and nonprofit spending. According to the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness, each homeless person costs all of us about 30,000 to 50,000 a year. Some have figured out what particular metropolitan areas spend on chasing their homeless problem. One opined the Seattle area spends more than a billion a year on homelessness. Another says San Francisco spends 275 million on homelessness. New York City reportedly spent $1.6 billion in 2016. Some studies go so far as to claim housing the homeless is cost neutral or even a cost savings. A 2016 article in the San Francisco Chronicle by journalist Kevin Fagan claims a homeless person costs San Francisco taxpayers 80,000 a year. But if the, if the homeless is housed in supportive housing, the cost is 20,000 a year. However, homeless policy expert Dennis Kelhane of Penn State cautions against overpromising that housing the homeless is cheaper than not doing so. We really don't know until we make an effort to ascertain what we spend now. So here's the thing. The existing homeless problem is untenable and unhealthy. We need only be reminded of the hepatitis, hepatitis outbreak in 2017 among the homeless in San Diego that killed at least 21 people, threatening all of us. A hotel concierge told me, a visitor in San Diego for a conference, that if I insisted on running the San Diego Esplanade in the afternoon, that I must not use the public restrooms to avoid exposure. There's only one solution, and that is to house the homeless. Since we cannot supply stick-built housing for all the homeless, and since they are willing, and in fact trying, to live in tents, RVs, and a variety of other places, we can meet them where they are, provide a lawful place, for their RV or a tent or a Quonset hut or whatever it is with the basic facilities and services they need. I suspect that the cost of my proposal is actually doable within existing funding programs, achievable once we wrap our arms around what we spend in the first place. If my solution is not a good one, then someone really needs to come up with one that's better. One thing is certain, continuing to do what we do and expecting a different result is insanity. Thank you.